tired of life is pushing you upstream Everybody around you seems to break up your dreams All you ever do just seems to make you want to scream Won't you let the sun shine in And if the springtime of your life is only rain And your music isn't loud enough to wipe out the pain Everything you do just seems to leave another stain Won't you let the sun shine in Yeah, let Jesus bring the sun shine in Jesus, bring the sun shining. Let him break you, make you watch out your sin. Let Jesus bring the sun shining. And if you're walking down the road all alone, going nowhere like a rolling stone, all you want to do is to find another home. Won't you let the sun shine in? Yeah, let Jesus bring the sun shining. Just choose living at a brand new day. Everybody let Jesus bring the sun shining. Yeah, let Jesus bring the sun shining. Let him break you, make you wash out your sin. Let Jesus bring the sun shining. So won't you turn around and walk the other way? Start of living in a Jesus, take what he has to say. Won't you let the sun shine in? Yeah, let Jesus bring the sun shine in. Yeah, let Jesus bring the sun shine in. Let him break you, make you watch at your sin. Let Jesus bring the sun shine in. Yeah, let Jesus bring the sun shine in. Yeah, let Jesus bring the sun shine in. Forgiven, whose way is covered by the Lord. Because there's a kind of peace the world can't deliver, even with a laser guided soul. The kindness of the counselor. Blindness of your choice won't bring you any closer to the place. The prophet and the preacher will do the best they know, but you gotta stand alone and face to face. Silent is the night Aching for the light Heavy is your hand Like the fever heat of summer on the land You're my hiding place You will deliver Deliver me from 
from all my trouble And you will instruct me in the way I should go You will keep your eyes upon me Silent is the night Aching for the light Heavy is your hand Like the fever heat of summer on the land Happy is the man whose sins are forgiven, whose way is covered by the Lord. So be glad and rejoice in the Lord, all you upright in heart. Everybody around you seems to break up your dreams 
All you ever do just seems to make you want to scream Won't you let the sun shine in And if the springtime of your life is till it rain And your music isn't loud enough to wipe out the pain Everything you do just seems to leave another stain Won't you let the sun shine in Yeah, let Jesus bring the sun shine in Yeah, let Jesus bring the sun shine in Well, good morning and welcome to Trinity Church, Lancaster. It's great to have you with us. A special warm welcome to those who are here watching for the first time. It's really great, isn't it, to, to gather together, to meet and to, to, to sing, to, to worship our God and to reflect on, on what he has to say to us, which we'll do together in, in a moment as Martin reads and, and preaches for us. I don't know about you, um, having church online, and Zoom, YouTube, Facebook, or whatever it is that you're watching um, on, it takes its toll, doesn't it? It feels like we haven't seen each other in such a long time. Um, I can't wait to, to meet back in person, physically on a Sunday morning or Wednesday, when it's all allowed, to, to, to be able to be with each other. Just to, to be able to see each other's faces uh, in person, in the flesh, is, is such a joy. But I think, and I think it raises a challenge for us, doesn't it, as church family? It's difficult to, to have the same in relationships, to keep them up and to, to keep looking out for one another as well as we do normally online. Perhaps I'll challenge us in this church family. How about this week or maybe the next couple of weeks? Um, you take someone from the church family out to the pub or out to the cafe or if you can't do that, you're far away, how about you message someone from the church family just to say, how are you doing? What's going on? Um, you know, in a way that you can, you can look out for one another. I think the challenge there is that we want to uh, put ourselves out there, don't we? We want to make sure as a church family we are all carry on going in the Lord Jesus. 
there's great challenges in the Bible to spur one another on, to keep each other going, fixing our eyes on Jesus together, um, making sure we do that for one another. So my challenge this week is take someone to the pub from church. If you're worried you don't have anyone to take, I'd love to join you. So give me a shout. One thing we can do together to spur one another on is to meet together midweek, as we have been doing, uh, to pray and to read the Bible. Um, And one thing I want to flag up this week is we're starting something new. Uh, Many of you will have heard us talk about this, but we're starting the Generosity Project. Um, It's a book that goes through six weeks of of course and training, um, looking at how we have received such generosity from God and then practically thinking about how we can use that in in our daily lives. Uh, We as a church want to think that for us as individuals, um, how we can be generous to our friends, our family, those we see on a day-to-day basis. But equally, we want to think about that as a whole church, As a church family, how can we be generous uh, because of the generosity we received from God? Um, We want to do this as a course, and we're going to do that over the next coming weeks. uh, Wednesday nights, 7 o'clock on Zoom. If you don't have the Zoom details, um, do get in touch. You can email in at office at trinitychurchlancaster.org.uk or equally pop a comment in the YouTube uh, or Facebook uh, comment section. But if you want to get hold of a book, which I'd highly recommend you do, it'll help us as we go through. There's uh, questions in there, and I think there's even space to write down um, any thoughts on on what you're thinking as we go through it together. Um, Do get in touch as well. Um, You can buy them from 10 of those websites. Um, Or, and I'd suggest you do this, is you drop me an email. Um, You can email me at my work email at rory at 10 of those.com. I can give you the price of £8 plus postage, or if you're in Lancaster, uh, just drop me a message and I'll, I'll charge you the £8 for the book and drop round the book for you. What a great service. Um, this, in fact, is Andy Niblett's book. He has contacted me and wants one, so, so he's already ahead. So if you haven't got one yet, um, we are meeting this Wednesday at 7 o'clock to, to, to study this together. I highly recommend getting hold of one. I wonder how you're feeling this morning. I wonder how you've come to church this morning. Perhaps you're like me, you've rolled out of bed. Um, This is not me on a Sunday morning. Um, But you've turned on YouTube, on on the TV, in the living room, and you're ready to to just sit along and and listen. Um, Possibly with sleep in your eyes and messy hair. And and just you're just there. Um, Perhaps it's been a busy week. Um, You're tired and you just don't necessarily feel like going to church as such. Perhaps actually Sunday morning sitting in front of the TV um, has become an easy thing to do, but actually your your heart's not in it, your head's not in it. Um, I often find that, that on a weekly basis, a daily basis really, I know the truth of the gospel. I know in my head that it's good, um, but sometimes I just don't feel it. Maybe you relate to that. Um, I've been really comforted recently by, by reading a book called Gentle and Lowly, written by a guy called Dane Ortland. He um, is basically looking at Jesus' heart for us, his heart for his people, and looks so carefully through the Bible, particularly the New Testament, at how Jesus interacts with his people who are sinners Sometimes we like to separate the two, but, but he looked at the reality of how we fail time and time again um, and how that makes us feel insignificant, makes us feel separate from God. But what Dane helpfully does is point us back to say, actually, Jesus loves to be with us, even in those points. Yes, Jesus hates sin, uh, but he loves us. I want to read you a point uh, from from his book. Uh, He's talking of of the chapter in Hebrews uh, 4, talking about how we have a high priest, Jesus, who is not unable to empathize with us in our suffering, in our temptation. Um, And he, he says this, let me read it for you. Consider your own life. When the relationship goes sour, when the feelings of futility come in, when it feels like life is passing us by, when it seems that our one shot at significance has slipped through our fingers, when we can't sort out our emotions, 
when the long-time friend lets us down, when a family member betrays us, when we feel deeply misunderstood, when we are laughed at by impressive, by the impressive. In short, when the fallenness of the world closes in on us and makes us want to throw in the towel, there, right there, we have a friend who knows exactly what such testing feels like and sits close to us, embraces us, with us, solidarity. Our tendency is to feel intuitively that the more difficult life gets, the more alone we are. As we sink further into pain, we sink further into felt isolation. The Bible corrects us. Our pain never outstrips what he himself shares in. We are never alone. That sorrow that fa feels so isolating, so unique, was endured by him in the past and is now shouldered by him in the present. It's a great truth, isn't it? That Jesus shoulders our pains, our frustrations, our felt isolation from God. He's experienced it himself and is willing to take it on now with us um, as our friend, our, our God, our Lord. Perhaps my words or, or Dane Orland's words aren't encouraging enough. Uh, but I, I want to show us a clip now and I hope uh, you can focus this morning on, on the words because I think they're so powerful. Um, I'm often tempted to show what's called a sermon jam um, and that's what I'm going to do. Now, this is a clip from, from a, a sermon by Matt Chandler. He's American, so apologies for the shoutiness of, of this clip. But he's speaking of something so crucial, so helpful for us to understand. He says, um, and you'll see it more passionately than I can even say now, but he will show us and, and does tell us that though we feel like we've let down God, and we have, though we feel like we've pushed him away, God loves us. He does not regret saving us. Let's watch this clip. And then after we've watched it, let's sing together as church family. Maybe sing at home or, or just listen to the, the lyrics. But we're going to sing the, the, the song Faithful One. Um, so let's listen to this clip. I hope it builds you up, spurs you on and helps you to keep standing firm in the great truth of the gospel. Our default position as strugglers is to believe that God's disappointed and frustrated. That he simply is tolerating us. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1 says, no, 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 no. Before the foundation of the earth was laid, he was going to adopt you, make you holy and blameless in his sight. So whether difficult days or good days, God's at work. God has not abandoned you in this difficult season. How amazing does that make our God that in our hypocrisy, he's long suffering with us. In our inability to live out all that he would call us to, he continues to lavish upon us his grace. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. So I love this word lavish, extravagant, plentiful, over the top. And so now when the Bible's talking about forgiveness, it's saying that his grace in forgiveness is lavish, like it's too much, like it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous amount, right? It's, it's, it's weight, it's over the top. It's out of control. Man of woman of God, in Christ but struggling, God does not regret saving you. He doesn't regret it. You haven't surprised him. You cannot surprise him. God is not watching where you are now, watching how you've struggled this week, watching how you stumble and fall, and regretting the decision to pay the price for you in full. You have no sin past 
present and future that has more power than the cross of Jesus Christ. None. This means that your salvation wasn't just a past event alone, but that Christ even now is continuing to save you. He didn't forgive your past sins and now leaving it up to you to conquer present and future sins, which means it doesn't matter how you came in here. It means God can rescue. It means God can save. And it means for those of us who are in Christ, you do not disgust him. You do not discuss it. You don't know what I struggle with and how deplorable it is. Um, I know that Jesus would say that he paid the bill in full, and so what you're saying is nonsense. That is the grace with which he lavished on us in his forgiveness. I'm counting the hairs on my head for, you've got to really concentrate. Wait, was it that one? Was that four? Was that three? I've lost count now. There's quite a few hairs on there. All right, I, I know, I count something else. Um, last time I went to the beach, I brought some sand home in a bag and I thought, well, I'll count a little bit at a time and see if I can count all the little grains of sand on the beach. So I'll start with, there's only a few here. So, uh, one, two, three. Actually, they do all look quite the same. There's, 
Oh, they do look the same. I can't remember which one I was up to. This is going to take forever. I have to do it later. <laughs> um, what else could I count? I know. I could go outside and count the leaves on the trees. But think of all the forests in the world and all the trees in the forests and all the leaves on the trees. Too many. There are some things when you think about them, they just seem to get bigger and bigger and bigger. What about people? There's so many people, aren't there? Like if, if I think about my family, there's my wife, Robin, and then there's me, and then there's Elliot, my boy, and his wife, Claire, and then Laura and her husband, Tim, and then there's Emily, and then there's Riley. And so that's, that's eight, and that's just our family. And then there's more families, there's more families next door, and there's people down the street and in our city, and then there's lots of cities in our country, and there's lots of countries in the world. So many people. Well, let me read something God says about people in the Bible. It's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, and it says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. There's so many people in the world, and they're all made by God in his image. That means he makes them to be like him, to love and to live and to do good like God. Now, I can't count all the people in the world, can I? Mm, let me think. No. But can God? Yes. And he doesn't just count people. He doesn't just... He doesn't just know how many there are. He knows them, each one. It's amazing. He loves them and he cares for them and he sees them all. And you know what? He calls them. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and to save us from our sins. All right. We should listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10. It's something about how precious people are. All right, let me have a look. Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 to 31. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. <laughs> Did you hear that? The hairs of our head are numbered. God sees us and he knows us. And sparrows, well, there's lots of sparrows and lots of birds. And God says he sees each one of them fall. And if he sees them, we don't need to be afraid because we are worth much more than sparrows. It's very good to know that, isn't it? Now, God cares for the sparrows. God cares for the ah, ah, the crow. The old black crow and the dig, 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 the wombat and the wriggle, wriggle gecko and the kangaroo. And there's a song about that. And I'm going to sing it now. Maybe you know it. There are actions. It's hard to do the actions when you're playing the guitar. But anyway, I might try. See what happens. All right. The old black crow. There's an old black crow. Sitting in the gum tree, he's plump and he's well fed. A beetle here, a cicada, there is the black crow's daily bread. I think it should be said, there's a lord who cares for the old black crow, the dig, the wombat, the gecko, and the kangaroo. And one thing sure, we are worth much more to the god who cares for me. To skiddly do. I just added that bit. All right, what's next? The wombat. Mrs. Wombat digs, come on, herself a little burrow to keep her warm and dry. It's a home sweet home that she's made her own, better than money can buy. And here's the reason why there's a lord who for the old black crow wombat the wombat the gecko and the kangaroo and one thing sure we are worth much more to the god who cares for people 
Two. Skiddly doo. All right, what's next? The gecko. Actually, the gecko sticks its tongue out. Can you stick your tongue out? That's right. <laughs> the gecko lives in the sands of the desert where it's very dry and hot. He's small and frail with a stumpy tail, but hungry he is not. All he needs he's got. There's a lord who cares for the old black crow, the wombat, the gecko and the kangaroo. And one thing sure, we are worth much more to the god who cares for people too. One's the kangaroo. Ready? The Lord cares too for the kangaroo. I think we all can see that worth much more to the living Lord is you and you and me and me and you and you and me. There's a Lord who cares for the old black crow, the wombat, the gecko and the kangaroo. And one thing sure, we are worth much more to the God who cares for people too. Skiddly do, skiddly do. Did you do all those actions? I think I did some of them, but I had to play the guitar as well. Well, it's precious to know that God cares for the world around us and he cares for us in a very special way. I think we should pray now. It's wonderful that he hears our prayers, isn't it? So let's talk to God. I'm gonna close my eyes so I can think about what I'm saying. Our great almighty God, you made us before we were made, you were, and you are from everlasting to everlasting. Thank you for the preciousness of people that you made us in your image, that you know us. Thank you that you sent Jesus and you called us to know him, that he saves us from our sins, saves us from sickness and badness and sadness. Thank you that our hair, the hairs of our, our head are numbered. That you care for the old black crow and the wombat, the gecko and the kangaroo. And you care for us, our Lord and our God and our Father. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ah! Ah! Bye. <laughs>
We ask that they would find hope in you, that you would meet their physical and spiritual needs and comfort those who have lost loved ones. Help us in the West to stand with our brothers and sisters in Christ, those who are suffering and facing persecution each day. Let us uphold them in our prayers and give to their need. Let us not forget them. Amen. And Heavenly Father, here in the UK, we are thankful for political stability. We pray for our government that they will make wise decisions to meet the needs of this country. Please help Christian politicians stay true to your word and speak out for justice and truth. We pray for those working in factories where coronavirus seems to be spreading quickly, that you will protect them so that they will be treated fairly and not be forced to work in conditions that are dangerous to their health. Father, we ask that your church in this country would offer support to those in need. We pray particularly for Christians Against Poverty, that you would bless their work, helping, to re helping them to reach people with help to manage debts and with the message of salvation for their souls. Thank you for the technology we enjoy that enables us at Trinity to meet virtually week by week. We ask that you will give us wisdom to know how and when we can start to meet physically again under the current restrictions. However we do meet, help us always to strive to encourage each other and build one another up in the knowledge and love of Christ and help us to be bold in proclaiming the good news of salvation for all people. As the psalmist concludes, Why, my soul, are you, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. Amen. Today's reading uh, continues in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, and we're going to be reading from verse 1 to verse 11. Uh, the words will be on the screen beside me, so read along with me. Starting at verse 1. If any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers. But instead, one brother takes another to court, and this is in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed and you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Trinity. It's lovely to be able to be with you again this morning. Some of you may not be aware that after the church meeting, we have a, uh, a Zoom call for anyone who wants to introduce themselves, say hi, a uh, chance to catch up and also a chance to uh, answer a few uh, questions or have a, a brief discussion about some of the issues that uh, may have been raised uh, during the meeting. So if uh, you've not joined that before, know that you're very welcome to uh, join us. If you want to uh, send us your email, uh, either in the chat on uh, YouTube or by e emailing us at office at trinitychurchlancaster.org.uk then we'll uh, send you on the details so you can uh, join us. That uh, kicks off at half past 11 after the end of the meeting. 
Well, we continue this morning looking at 1 Corinthians together, and we've got to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, the passage that was read to us a moment ago. In the 21st century, uh, in the early 70s, uh, the Kinks famously lo- wrote a lyric uh, about a mixed up, modelled up, shook up world. In the first century, in the mid 50s, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter that we know as 1 Corinthians uh, to a mixed up, modelled up church. And he did it to shake them up in the hope that they take stock and get real. But we found out over the last few weeks just how mixed up they were and that their problems stem in very large part from muddled and mixed up thinking about Jesus and his kingdom. It seems that over time uh, and under pressure from the surrounding culture, uh, they've uh, begun to move away from or at least are less clear about certain key aspects of Jesus' message. And this was having an effect, a disastrous effect, on how they looked at life and how they lived it, and their witness to the world. It was a mixed up, muddled up church, and they were heading for destruction. Let me read you a verse that we haven't come to yet from near the end of the book. It comes in chapter 15, verse 34. Uh, And in many ways, chapter 15 is a climax to the book. Verse 34 reads, Come back to your senses as you ought, and stop sinning. For the summer who are ignorant of God, and I say this to your shame. In other words, come on guys, wake up, get real, and stop it. Rather than being thankful, they'd become proud and arrogant, and were behaving in ways that, whether they realised it or not, were undermining their message, their witness. There were rifts and splits and rivalry and infighting, and they were getting themselves into a right old mess. Our passage this morning, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 to 11, shows us, well, just how muddled they'd become, just how much mess they got themselves into. And it'll be good to look at it, not only to see what was going on, but also to see how Paul handled it, and to ask ourselves what we can learn from it all. Again, as previously, we don't get all the details, but it's clear that the current dispute, that there's a current dispute going on that's landed some of them in courts, in a civil matter, verse 1. A dispute, a grievance. There's been a falling out between two church members, and it's ended up in court. Uh, Not the criminal courts, but the civil courts. Don't think Old Bailey so much as Judge Judy or Judge Rinder. It's important to recognise that Paul is not, in these verses, undermining the validity or denying the place of the criminal justice system or criminal courts. His word should not be taken as an excuse for covering up criminal activities of church members or going on in the church. Such misreadings have happened in the past when, for example, accusations of sexual abuse uh, have been dealt with in-house and not uh, uh, reported to the authorities. That's not what Paul is saying here. That's not what he's teaching. Uh, And if you doubt that uh, at all, read Romans 13, where it's clear that the authorities, including the courts, exist because George, God has established them to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. And the church uh, should not ignore that. What Paul is talking about here is disputes between believers, most likely some conflict over money or property, a rent owed, an outstanding loan, a dispute over a boundary fence that's not been maintained, something like that. Christian A takes his or her brother or sister B to the civil courts to get what they feel is their due. And Paul's response, verse 1, is, how dare you? How dare you? The language here is emphatic. You may remember back in verse 14 of chapter 4, Paul didn't want to shame them. This time he shows no such restraint. Do you see verse 5? He wants to shame them. They are proud. He wants to humble them. They may not understand what they're doing as shameful. Uh, They clearly don't. But it is. Hang on, you say. Justice is important, isn't it? God is a God of justice, isn't he? Justice matters, doesn't it? Surely justice should be done. The law is there to see that it's done, isn't it? Well, no. Not according to Paul here, it isn't. The fact that they're taking one another to court 
doesn't demonstrate that justice matters. Rather, it shows, verse 7, that they've completely lost the plot. Do you see verse 7? He says, The very fact that you have lawsuits among yourself means you have been completely defeated already. What does he mean by that? I say this to shame you, he says. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? I mean, he sounds exasperated, doesn't he? In these couple of chapters, half a dozen times or more, Paul writes, don't you know, don't you know? So 5 verse 6, don't you know? 6 verse 2, do you not know? Verse 3, do you not know? Verse 9, do you not know? The implication is clear, is clear isn't it? They should, they should jolly well know that taking one another to court uh, is shameful. You Corinthians, you think yourself as wise, don't you? And yet there is no one among you wise enough to rule in this trivial dispute? Paul wants to bring the Corinthians down a peg or three. No, he needs to bring them down a peg or three. Why? Well, because their behaviour was putting themselves at risk. Do you see verse 8? They're cheating and doing wrong to brothers and sisters in Christ. Do they not know, verse 9, that those who cheat and do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? You Corinthians, you think that you're okay. And it doesn't matter what you do, how you behave. You know, once saved, always saved, perhaps. Well, it's not quite as simple as that. As we'll see further on in the letter, in Paul's warnings that he gives in chapter 10, when we get to them, he writes this to them. If you think you are standing firm, you Corinthians, be careful that you don't fall. And there's real irony here again. The Corinthians thought that they were standing firm. They were the mature ones. They were the wise ones, able to teach other believers generally, and Paul here in particular, a thing or two. Was there really no one wise enough among themselves to settle this silly dispute? Verse 5. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? Well, yes, clearly is possible because they've ended up in court. They seem to have forgotten who they are. The contrast in verses 1 to 6 is between two communities, two ages, two judgments. Do you not know? Well, you should know, you know. You should. And live in the light of the fact that you are all members of God's family. The Lord's people. Verse 1, verse 2, verse 4. And you should be living in the light of who you are. Brothers and sisters living together in the light of eternity, which is yours in Christ. You know, or you should know, that at the end of this present age... The Lord's people, the people of the Messiah, who have proved faithful to him, will sit with their king as judges of the whole world. Those who are on the inside, by virtue of Christ, their Passover lamb, will, with their Lord and king, judge those on the outside. All believers will sit as law lords in the greatest legal act imaginable. Look, he says, you've been appointed to the Supreme Court that will judge everyone, including angels. And then you're saying that you're incapable of sorting out who should be looking after a boundary fence? Don't you realise that whoever wins in court, all of you will have lost? Better to have been cheated, better to have been wronged, than take one another to court. If you are not prepared to be cheated and defrauded for a bigger, higher cause, then you know what? You're no disciple of Christ. Ouch. When I was uh, a young kid, my parents got involved in a dispute with our neighbours at the bottom of our garden. Uh, the neighbours took exception to some fir trees that were growing near the garden wall. So one night, they went uh, to the end of the garden, knocked down the wall uh, between us, cut uh, down a couple of the trees and stole some of my mother's tomato plants, uh, for good measure. They then sued us for allowing our trees to damage their wall. Well, it all ended up in court, complete with solicitors and barristers and soil specialists. 
eventually the truth came out. It wasn't a very edifying experience, as you can imagine, and did little for neighbourly relations. Imagine that it wasn't the Souls and the Hicks, uh, that was their name, uh, referred to by my parents as the horrible Hicks, uh, perhaps for justifiable reason. Imagine that it wasn't the Souls and the Hicks who ended up in court, but the Souls and the Werners, fighting over some boundary trees. Imagine the repercussions not only on our relationship, but that of the wider church family. Imagine the response of a watching world. Think of the harm that would be done. You people tell us what to believe and how to behave. Well, look at yourself. You bunch of hypocrites. Which is why Paul writes, verse 7, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? If Karen and I ended up facing Andy and Rosie in court, fighting to the right, fighting to right a perceived wrong, it would show, wouldn't it, that we'd completely lost the plot. Not treating one another as brothers and sisters properly, as co-heirs with Christ. We should rather be wronged, want to be wronged, uh, by a brother or sister in Christ than do wrong and end up in court. Question. Glance down at verse 7 for a moment. Who does it remind you of? Who was it that chose to be wronged rather than stand on his rights? Who was it who was cheated and lied about and suffered as a result? Does it not remind you of the attitude and behaviour of the Lord Jesus as he went to the cross? You lend a Christian friend some money to see him through a difficult patch. They promise to pay you back in instalments. You get the first instalment, it's a bit late, but you get it. You get the second instalment, it's late again, later still actually, uh, and now a bit less than you'd agreed. Then the repayments dry up. You have a quiet word and nothing changes. How do you respond? Who do you speak to? Where do you turn? Not according to Paul, to the civil courts. That's not how you win. How do you win in such circumstances? To win is to follow Jesus. He did not go to the law against his opposers, but he was the one who won. If you're not prepared to set aside your rights and be cheated and defrauded for a bigger cause, then you're not following Jesus and you won't win. Now let's not pretend for a moment that that is easy, or not tough. Sometimes it's a very tough call. Don't hear me say that it won't be difficult. It will be. But then no one said following Jesus would be easy, did they? Well, Jesus certainly didn't. Do you remember his words recorded for us in Mark 8 about anyone who would be his disciple? Remember what he said? Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Do you want to be a disciple of Jesus? Well, Corinthians, don't you know how you should behave in these circumstances? Are you not willing to be wronged and face injustice for the sake of others? No? Well, you should, you know. All of which brings us to verse 9, where it seems at first glance uh, Paul takes a huge sideways step and blow things up, uh, and seems to raise the ante as he begins to talk about heaven and hell. Why does he do that? He seems to be saying, is saying, friends, you're either in or out. I can't put it any starker than that. That's what he's saying, isn't it? When it comes to heaven and hell, you're either in or out. Well, both actually, isn't it? You're in and out, because if you're in one, you're out of the other, and vice versa. Such talk is not, in fact, a bigger sidestep as it might at first seem. For salvation, the issue that the Gospel addresses, is a future salvation from judgment. That is what the Gospel, the good news, is fundamentally about. In fact, it's a judgment he's already spoken about in verses 2 and following. Life is a game of big stakes, says Paul, very big stakes, where in the end there are only two ends. You either inherit the kingdom or you don't. It's heaven or it's hell. 
Never think, never think, Corinthians, that it doesn't matter how you behave. It does. It really does. Paul could not be clearer here, could he? Wickedness takes people to hell. And so that we get the point, he gives us a list of the kind of behaviour that takes people to hell. Verse 9. For several reasons, it's not a very comfortable list. I don't think it's meant to be. Any sexual congress outside the place God has ordained for it to occur, monogamous heterosexual marriage, is the kind of behaviour, says Paul, that sends you to hell. Don't do it. Adultery, sexual activity with anyone other than your spouse, is the kind of behaviour, says Paul, that sends you to hell. Don't do it. Same-sex sexual intercourse, common in the first century in the Greco-Roman world, is a kind of behaviour that sends you to hell, says Paul. Widespread and generally approved homosexual conduct is not something that is confined only to modern times. It was common and approved of in Paul's day too, but not approved by God. Don't do it. Greed, living for what you can get in this life, and being eager to get more and more. Greed is the kind of behaviour, says Paul, that sends you to hell. Don't do it. Alcohol is dangerous. Drunkenness is not sophisticated. The culpable abuse of alcohol is not a bit of a laugh. It's the kind of behaviour, says Paul, that sends you to hell. Don't do it. Slander, verbal abuse, no doubt extending to the written word, to Twitter and beyond. Slander is the kind of behaviour, says Paul, that sends you to hell. Don't do it. Well, what do you make of Paul's list? It's an interesting collection of behaviours, don't you think? And quite an extensive one, covering a very wide range of behaviours. I wonder how reading it makes you feel, such a wide list. It would be surprising, I think, if at some point or other we didn't all feel touched by it to one degree or another. And I'm sure it's not a complete list. Paul could have gone on much longer, but he didn't. He chose this list, and I'm sure because his re readers were all touched by it at some point. And Paul knows it, verse 11. And that is what some of you were. But, but, but something had happened to them, verse 11. Look at me, will you, for a moment? Verse 11, something had happened that changed everything. They have been changed. They have been washed, washed clean of their guilt. They have been taken over by God's Spirit and made holy. They have been sanctified, set apart. And they have been put right with God. They have been justified, declared right, even though they are wrong. Though wicked, though they have behaved wickedly and deserving and are deserving of hell, they had received the verdict of the last day now and been declared not guilty. Not because of anything they'd done, but because of what God had done. What Christ had done for them at Calvary. What Christ's Spirit had done in their lives, applying that death to them by faith. And that changed everything. Friends, if that is not yet true for you, if that has not happened, if you have not yet been washed, sanctified, justified, if you have not responded to the call of God and the work of his spirit by trusting in Jesus' death for you, you need to do that. You really do. I'm not seeking to frighten anyone with talk of heaven and hell. I just want to be faithful to what the Bible says and what Jesus taught. Because if you don't turn to God in repentance and trust in Jesus' death for yourself, your behaviour will lead you to hell. And friend, if, friends, if what was true of those Corinthian believers back then is true of you this morning, if you have been washed, sanctified, justified by responding to the work of God in Christ, by trusting in his death for you, well, hear this. Hear what the Corinthians need to hear. Take on board what they needed to take on board. You cannot let your behaviour continue as before. You just cannot. I must bring things to a close, but do you see Paul's method here? How he's argued? What he's done in these verses? 
It's what he often does. He identifies a problem, sees that at the root of that problem is a failure to understand the gospel properly and a failure to live in the light of that understanding. And so what does he do? He reminds them of the gospel and the wonder of it and of being caught up in it. If you have been washed, if you have been sanctified, if you have been justified, it's got to change you. It's got to change us. It just has. We can't be content with behaviour that sends people to hell. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, thank you for these words of Paul and their challenge. A challenge uh, to us who have been washed, have been sanctified, have been justified by trusting Christ's death for us, to live in the light of that in our relationships with one another and with the watching world. And Heavenly Father, if anyone listening, watching this morning, has not yet fled to Christ to be washed, to be cleansed, to be sanctified, to be justified, and to escape from hell, to be received in heaven, to join your family. Heavenly Father, we pray that they would flee their sin. And we ask that for Christ's sake. Amen. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Mistakes we can't forget, and the sins that still beset, we have a lamb. We have a lamb for our fault and anxious realm, for the fears that overwhelm. We have a throne, we have a throne, we sing worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain for the world, royal
we have a father we have a father for our treks through burning sands to our home in promised lands this home